through Russian history, believe it or not, there are lots of examples of irregular forces operating with the Russian army. They carry out eventually insurrections against the Russian army. There were examples under Peter the Great's father, Alexei Mikhailovich, the Tsar at that time in the 17th century. Um, this is the uprising of Stenka Razin. Peter the Great had to face this with uh, uh, Mazepa, who was the chief of the Zaporozhian Cossacks. Catherine the Great had to face this with Pugachev in the late 18th century. There were fewer incidents of this kind in the 19th century, but the consistent story whenever these kind of uprisings took place is that the Russian authorities eventually, when they gained control, acted with extreme ruthlessness in putting down these insurrections whenever they happened. So this is not if it was the Russian authorities, all I'm saying is it would not be a unique instance in Russian history. And if you want to join up dots, and I'm going to just go through this, but I want to say that I don't think personally that the dots should be joined up in this way. But if you want to join up the dots, there might be some recent events which might point to things. There was a meeting between Prigozhin and Putin and the heads of the Wagner organization back in July. And it was clearly an attempt by Putin to try to win over the commanders of the um, Wagner organization and to break Prigozhin's hold over them. And Prigozhin intervened and he basically sabotaged the meeting. And it could be that after that, there was a decision made that this was impossible. We can't really resolve this. Rigozhin retains his hold over Wagner. We can't have this uncontrolled armed militia floating around. Some kind of decision needs to be made. Then a few days ago, Putin visited the chief of the military headquarters in Rostov-on-Don, same place where, uh, which Prigozhin and his men captured back in June. And he had some kind of conference there with the military leaders. We don't know very much about it. There's not even been photos of that conference circulated, which is unusual. Then a couple of days ago, we heard that Surovikin, who is the head of the, was the head of the Russian Aerospace Forces, important military commander, one said to be sympathetic to Prokhorshin. There's reports also, by the way, unconfirmed, that he has been dismissed. So you could say that Putin had this meeting with Prigozhin, the meeting didn't go well, the Wagner commanders remained loyal to him. He, an investigation continued since June. They were looking into what happened during the uprising in, in June. Um, they came to a decision that Prigozhin had to be removed from the scene in the way that those people that I talked about, you know, who'd rebelled against previous Tsars were removed from the scene. Putting him through a trial process would be embarrassing and difficult and potentially dangerous. So they cleared the decks. They conferred with the military leaders. Putin went to confer with the military leaders. Surovikin, the one general who is seen as somehow sympathetic to um, Prigozhin, was removed from the scene. And then the thing was done. I don't believe this. <laughs> I, mean, I want to say that. I just wanted to set out how you could perhaps create, not a case, because it's not a case, but something that, you know, you might lead you to certain conclusions which might cause you to ask questions. I don't believe it. And the reason I don't believe it is the following. First of all, I don't think Prigozhin represented any kind of threat to the Putin government. That is the first thing to say. The second thing to say is, just like yourself, I think having an incident like this in the middle of the BRICS summit makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. I mean, the very last thing you would have thought that Putin would want is to remind everybody, the, all the BRICS leaders, of the Prigozhin affair. So, I mean, it's something that he would not want to see happen at this time. But the third reason, and the one which I think to me, actually settles the issue, is that, of course, on that plane was Prigozhin, the other Wagner people, 
but also the pilots, the people who are operating the plane. You know, it's commonplace in the West to see Putin as this utterly ruthless man, a complete killer, a man who's absolutely callous, all that kind of thing. Um, I think Putin can be pretty tough and pretty ruthless when he has to be, as all political leaders who lead big countries have to be, and we're going to discuss what the West does in these situations later. But I don't think he's the sort of person, in fact, I can say quite certainly that he is the kind of person who would be, I mean, it would be inconceivable to me that he would simply set aside, uh, uh, arrange the murder of completely innocent Russians when there are such more straightforward and easy ways of getting Prigozhin off the scene if a decision was made to dispose of him. So, you know, he's, Prigozhin is going to Africa. He made a video which is supposed to have been made by him in Africa. You know, lure him to some place like Niger or Chad or the Central African Republic, find somebody to shoot him there. It happens. Kill him in that kind of a way. Blame it on the jihadis. It seems to me... That would not involve the murder of people in Russia, and it would avoid any kind of embarrassment for the Russian government of the kind we would have seen if a plane had been brought down in this kind of way. And all of that makes me think it most unlikely that Putin or the Russian government was involved. So I set out certain circumstantial facts which you could put together to come to a conclusion. But I've thought about it long and hard, and I've also said why I don't think it was the case.